see, Christ has no feet on this earth, no hands and feet on this earth except for you and I. And if Jesus can do what he did and the same spirit that was in him lives in us, we too can be witnesses and examples and take love to this world. You see, today we sit here today because somebody has sown into our lives. And if you think about where you are, whether it's somebody who prayed for you, who gave in to you, who sacrificed, who loved, who provided unconditional support, they did it for you. You see, when I think about my life, I continually give thanks for the people who sowed into my life. And for me, if uh, you don't know my story, despite growing up with Olympic dreams and, and being able to go overseas with my athletics at 14 and 15, I was lured into the drug scene by going to a rave party. When I went to this rave party at 15, I began to get exposed to things like LSD and ecstasy. And before long, I met my first boyfriend. I was using speed by the time I was 15. And by the time I was 18 years old, I was addicted to heroin. I remember being 21 and a half years old. And I guess if there was a point of darkness in my life, it was then. And if there was a time that I would wake up and I would go, is my life even worth living? Because what the enemy tries to do is come and silence and come to push down and come to rob you of hope because what he wants is another one for his kingdom. And in this point where I felt that I was barely surviving, I needed a miracle to try and rescue me out of that darkness. And drug addiction and things that go along with it is never just about the person in it. It involved my whole family. So where I thought I could clutch onto my parents for survival, they weren't praying Christians. So it was almost like the, the enemy had dragged my family into this dark world. So I was 21 and a half when I was charged by the police when I started to cry out from the bottom of my heart to the Lord. Isn't it funny that in our heart we have this cry that when we're in need of help, we cry out to him. Whether people are Christians or not, when they hit their toe, they'll go, oh my God. Or when they bump their elbow, they'll go, oh my God. Because the cry of our heart when we're in desperate need is, oh my God, help me. And at this point where I was, I was crying out to the Lord. I remember standing in a courtroom one day, on, on the day that I had to go to court. And if there was a time that I needed the grace the most, it was then. And it was then that I started to remember different perfect labourers, Christians, that came out of their comfort zone to talk to me over the last several years. And I remember standing there and the first one was a social worker. And because of her limited abilities to be able to lay hands on and evangelise because she worked in a government role, she wasn't pushed down and thought, well, I can't actually do anything to help this girl. She got creative and she started to proclaim the good news by actually going away to her cell group and begin to pray for me. You see, we don't need to be limited by just the good works that we do. We have a whole lot of resources and giftings that we can draw on. She would pray for me for the next few years until when I stood there, I knew that there was this one thing in the woman, in this woman that was beginning to change my life. Prayer changes things. And this woman was Acts 2 at its best, to go and preach the gospel without saying a word. That she was kind, she was loving, she was listening, she comforted, she probably bound up my broken heart in the closet. But when I needed God, I started to realise there was this one thing about this woman. I didn't know what it was until years later, but she was a praying Christian. And secondly, there was a lady I used to work with and she used to follow me down and tell me about her story and her testimony about how Jesus would rescue her. But in my point of brokenness and, and in my denial, I used to tease her and mock her and put her down. But she never let that um, kind of push her aside and silence her. She continued to get into my space. When people of the world reject you because of your Christian faith, it doesn't say anything about you. It says a lot about them because she continued to get into my life and speak things into me and say, if God can do it for me, you know he can do it for you. And not once did she bow down and let a blanket of rejection from my brokenness cover her. She just kept pushing past it, way past her comfort zone to say, God loves you. 
And the next, and, and when I used to lay in my bed at three, four o'clock in the morning, when I couldn't get onto drugs, whose voice would I hear in my head? Then this girl who would say, you know, if God can do it for me, he can do it for you. She knew how to proclaim the good news by taking her testimony to the world. You see, nobody can argue your story. And the last one was a guy who just continually used to ask me to go to church. And I used to deny the invitation and say I was too busy and it wasn't for me. But he didn't stop inviting me. He kept inviting me. And when I stood in the courtroom, these three people came to mind. And at that point, you see, I love the uh, the verse in Romans. It says, how beautiful are the feet are those who bring the good news. Because how can we call upon the one and be saved unless we hear it? We need to deliver it and plant the seed. One will plant, one will water, and it's God who brings the increase. But as a church, we need to mobilise ourselves and be bold and realise the Spirit of the Lord is on you to go out and take the message of the good news to this world because you have the answer that they so desperately need. And regardless of their response, we need to keep reminding ourselves that we have a calling, that we have a mandate, and we need to rise up and take this answer to them. That I was given the opportunity to go into a program called Teen Challenge. When I arrived at Teen Challenge, they were the ones who again proclaimed the good news. They were the ones that came and bound up my broken heart. They proclaimed freedom over my life. They began to set me free from oppression and depression and the darkness that covered my life. They knew how to just come aside and not complicate things, but use this as a framework and a calling to what we do. The local church began to disciple me when I actually came out. That I started to realise that if God can do it in me, Perhaps he can take what he has done in me and share it with the world because God will bring us through so that we can take others through. As Christians, we're not called to survive because survival is selfish. It's all about us. But as Christians, we're called to overcome because when we overcome, we bring other people with us. And we need to stand on the promise of God that says, that God will turn all things around for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. No matter what you're walking through, he will actually always turn it around into your favour so that he can work in and through you to reach this world. He can turn your mess into a message, your test into a testimony, your obstacles into opportunities, your adversities into triumph. And this is your message And the testimony that you can take out and say, you know, if God can do it for me, he can do it for you. You see, we need to be mobilised beyond the walls and take the message of Jesus to the world. Proclaim the good news because the spirit of the Lord is on you. It's in you to flow out of you and give life like a cup of cold water to those who are thirsty to drink it. My challenge in this whole area came about seven years ago when I had finished the Teen Challenge program. I was in the local church. My husband took up a role. I'd written two books, started to distribute them. I had two children under two and I was standing in my kitchen having a very stressed out morning when my telephone rang. And as I picked up the telephone on the other end of the line, there was a lady there and she was asking for Jade Lewis. And I said, well, it's Jade Lewis here. And she said, well, who are you? And I said, well, who are you? And she says, well, I'm a volunteer who goes into the prison and some of the women have been reading your book. Do you think you can come in and actually meet some of these women and encourage them and inspire them and help them? And as I watched my two children under two, wiping Vegemite thoroughly up and down my wall, I answered very quickly and firmly, thank you very much for the invitation, but no thank you. So I've moved on in that area of my life now. I'm in the local church. I've got two children and I had every excuse to say no. And rationally, you'd go, yeah, perfect. But deep in my heart, I knew that God wanted me to step out of my comfort zone and inconvenience myself and go and meet some of these women. And my first few visits in there were far from ideal. When I was greeted with a whole room of prisoners, 
the first time was fine because on the front row was my cousin. So that was really good because, like, you know, she was really nice to me and got everyone else to be nice to me. But then honeymoon time finished. Where when I went in there, they were mocking me and they were rude and they didn't want to listen. They just keep talking, walk in and out of the room. And I don't know about you, but when we take a step to do something for the Lord, sometimes the blanket of darkness comes upon us. And the enemy knows that you're about to walk into his territory and shine the light of Jesus, that it's almost like sometimes the very thing that you begin to represent and stand up for, the enemy will try to come and undermine and pull you down. That every time I walked in there, I would get so intimidated that for 12 months I declined that invitation and I said, not for me, I've tried it. But you see, we are not walking around fighting with our flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers and the darkness and the rulers of this world, that the Spirit of the Lord is on us because it's the anointing that will break the yokes of bondage. We can't go in there in our own strength. You can't go out there and go, I just want to do something nice for somebody. Do it not in your own strength, but do it with the anointing that is upon you so that if the enemy tries to come and silence and push you down and discourage you and bring disappointment or start to work out outwardly to try and get to you, that you know that it's not by might and it's not by power, but it's by, by the Spirit of the Lord that is upon me. So within a year, I decided I'm going to go back in. My husband's feet were like in my back. You have to do this. I'm like, well, what about if you do it? And he pushed me all the way in there. We had this meeting and we're sitting with the the superintendent. He goes on this one particular Friday, you can go and start your program on Tuesday. I was like, fantastic. And we left the prison and I said to Tristan, wow, that was just amazing. That was like too easy. He's like, I know, that was awesome. He said, but I'm really worried. He said, what program are you going to use? I was like, I don't know. I don't know what program I'm going to use. But when I walked in there, I remember leaving that, the prison that day. And I remember driving home and the Holy Spirit spoke so clearly to my heart. He said to me, this is the mantle that I've been preparing you for. And he began to speak to me and minister to me through Matthew 25 to go and feed those who were hungry and give drink to those who were thirsty and clothe those who had none and visit those who were in prison, knowing that when I did this for the least of these, I was doing it unto the Lord. Because you see, somebody came when I was considered very much like these women, the least, the lonely, the last, the unlovely, Somebody inconvenienced themselves for me. And when you think about your situation, however, you came to find the Lord and come to Christ, somebody stopped and did it for you. And now with this answer, we should actually take that and do it for the world. Because when I walked into this prison, I start to see the profile of women prisoners here in Western Australia. They have limited education, lack of vocational training. 90% of them have been sexually and physically abused, which has caused a lot of mental and emotional trauma. They have limited coping skills. And so this is why many of them turn to drugs and alcohol as a way to self-medicate. 81% of the women serving time in Bandia are in there for drug and alcohol-related offences. And this vicious cycle in their life just goes on and on and on until they come to an end point, and many of them, it is in prison. They are damaged women. And over the last 10 years, 84% growth in there of women going to prison. And furthermore, 67% of these women that we work with are mothers. So where are their children? I can understand when Jesus said that the enemy comes to kill and steal and destroy. And that when we go into the world, we have the answer to say, but Jesus, he is the one who gives life and he gives it abundantly. That when I went in there, I started to see that these were women who have reached the lowest ebbs of life. They were locked up, rejected by society, damaged, broken, And although they're in there because they've hurt community and there's many victims out here, 
in fact, many of these women are victims themselves. Jesus came for these, these females. And so when I went in there and I started to take that step of faith, because God's not moved by our needs, by what we have. I know what I had. I had a lot of fear and trepidation. And I didn't know what I was going to see on the other side. But he's moved by our faith because faith is the only thing that pleases him. So when I went into the prison, I remember sitting with these these women and I thought I didn't have a program, but I taught them how to run because I could run. And they seemed to have a lot to say. So I thought I'll teach them how to run and get them to run for an hour and then I'll talk to them for an hour. Perfect. So we began to sit down and I started to see that these women didn't need correction but they needed restoration. And you know the word restore, it means to bring back to an original condition. And in Joel 2.25, God will restore what the locust has taken. And when God restores their life and when God restored my life and when God restores your life, what that means is that he comes back to the entry point where that situation happened or the disappointment came or the fear entered or something happened and he comes and he removes it. And he starts again because in Jesus, all things are made new. It's like a blank canvas comes and we can begin to rewrite our story. So when I looked at these women, I believed that they needed to be restored to start all over again. And I started to wonder, well, what am I going to teach them? And God said to me, go back to Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord is on me to go He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, that the anointing was going to break the yoke of bondage, not me. I could proclaim the good news, bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim freedom for them, release from darkness the prisoners, the oppression, bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, oil of joy instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of despair that this became the framework and the thing that guided, well, what am I going to teach these women? And when we're going out working in the community and we're going out and we're seeing love in action, because love is a verb, it means that we have to move. You see, we can see a need and we can sit and cry about it, but that's just sympathy. But when we move and we cross the street and we go to help these people, you see, that's compassion. Because compassion will move past our convenience and will past our comfort And when you begin to sow and you begin to input into people's lives, you might not see immediate fruit. But the more you sow and the more you keep praying and the more you keep giving and the more you keep providing and the more that you keep loving and the more that you keep giving patience to help these people become whole, you'll begin to see some incredible testimonies and some fruit come forth. Today we are doing these three many programs. We run personal development programs. We run run sporting programs. We do Bible studies. We run youth programs. We'll be starting up a brand new uh, boys program. So we're extending now out into the boys arena. Um, Corrective Service have come and said, we've seen the great work that is happening within the girls. Do you think you can extend this with the boys? And when we sit down and we look at the program, we never stray away from Isaiah 61. Lord, what do you want us to do? Well, you see, this was Jesus' mission statement and as it should be ours. You see, we don't need to build things up and complicate it. We just do what the Lord has instructed us to do and we go out to this world because all of us can do it. Because if the same spirit lives in us that lived in Jesus, that rose him from the dead, then we can do everything in Jesus' name. You see, we start to get, we're mentoring up to 50 women a week in the prison and when they come out, we give toiletry packs, we allow time that they can pray, we teach them how to worship and all of a sudden we begin to see these broken and these bruised women into a position where they feel hopeful. Recently I had the children's court judge come visit me at my offices and he said to me, He said, I'm wondering, what do we do with these young people? He said, you know, I'm considered like the bad guy because I'm sending kids to prison. He said, I don't know what else to do. He said, what do you think the answer is? And I said to him, well, the answer is this. We can't just teach them to say no to things like drugs and crime and violence because that's very much like when we go on a diet and we go, I'm not going to eat that Mars bar. I'm not going to eat that Mars bar. I'm not going to eat... And then you eat the Mars bar within a very short amount of time. 
but we've got to give them something bigger. And I said, instead of just trying to correct what they're doing, I said, we need to give them hope that is so much bigger than their past. We've got to give them a reason to walk away. We've got to give them a network of people that can support them. I said, but unless they have hope in the first place, they will be lured back to their past because it's familiar, it's comfortable. And some of them don't even know the difference from right and wrong. We've got to give people hope. And I began to have the privilege of watch God move and transform lives and watch women's self-esteem develop and grow. And there is power in the gospel. There is power in prayer. God will do for us what he has spoken. He is a God that will not lie. He is a God of truth. And if he says he will do it, he will do it. There is no bondage that God cannot break. There is no promise too hard for God. There's no prayer too big, no problem that he cannot solve, no disease he cannot heal, no heart he cannot mend, no need he cannot meet, the enemy that cannot be defeated. There is nothing that our God cannot do. You see, God is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. And you know, God knew the solution before you even had your problem. That when we position ourselves and make him bigger in our lives than what we're walking through, then he will always cause us to triumph. Jesus will bring transformation and he transforms people's lives. And when he transforms people's lives, he will transform communities. And when he transforms communities, he will transform our nations. And so the work that God has called me and my husband to do is reach those who, hurt, who have hurt the community, the worst of them, and try and teach them another way of living, pro-social behaviours, teach them that there is new life in Jesus, that when they come out, it never stops there because we teach them that God saved them to send them, that they're to take their message and now go out and spread the good news to those around them. So we're going to, I'm going to show you a couple of movies of the girls that have been through our programs before we finish off in prayer. And when you look at these girls, don't be fooled to think that that was just like an overnight success. The first one that you will see well, when uh, Deanne's story comes up, she was my first student and she was probably one of the hardest. She used to tell me at Bandy Up, I'm going to use drugs again, you know that, don't you? And I'd be like, oh, Really? Okay, because it was just me running the programs then. I've got 10 staff now that go and run the programs for me. So at that time, and I would take everything so personally, I'd be like, please don't use drugs. You've just worked so hard to get this far. She says, I probably will. She was homeless. She had four children to three fathers. She had lots of debt. She had lots of brokenness, multiple abortions, mental health issues. This woman was a bruised reed. But I would pray and pray and pray. And when you look at her shortly years and years, and now she's good. She works for Teen Challenge. And you know the irony is that she does all the inductions of my girls in our current prison programs, and she inducts them to go down to Teen Challenge and gets them in there and down there where they're just getting discipled and strong. And and you'll see a testimony, a whole line of testimonies from our girls soon. But now she's my co-worker, you know, and we relate, and sometimes she rings up, she goes, Jade, I think that they're trying to pull one over me. I think they're trying to get drugs at the gate when they get released, and they're not allowed to go down to Teen Challenge on drugs. And I'm like, oh, gosh, revenge is so sweet. (laughs) I said, you used to do that to me. (laughs) I'm like, don't worry, that won't get too far, because God knows, and that's why he's revealing this stuff to you. But now we, um, I was her bridesmaid, my husband married her, and, um, and I've been bridesmaid for a few, so we're, it's like this 27 dress thing. And I say to the girls, you've got to find other bridesmaids, okay? I'll read a Bible verse for you. <laughs> but we have a great time with these girls. And when you see them, um, you'll begin to see um, that God is so powerful and he can change lives and, and, and he will do it and, uh, because that's what he promises us. Amen? Okay. <laughs> Growing up in a broken family with learning struggles at school, left feeling isolated and having a great sense of failure about my life. I took to the streets at 15 and would sleep wherever I could find a place. My mum would often come to look for me to bring me home, but I would refuse. 
Being introduced to injecting speed at 17 was the beginning of a life of crime, violence, addiction and various domestic violent relationships. As a way of funding my increasing drug use, I started my own methamphetamine lab. During this time, I had four children. In 2009, I was arrested and taken to Bandy Up Women's Prison for manufacturing methamphetamines. I had lost everything. My family, my children, my friends, my dignity. I'd lost hope. Funnily enough, my relationship with my dad strengthened while I was in prison because for the first time in a long time, he saw me drug free. I began to understand that freedom is not found within four walls in which you find yourself, but true freedom comes from within. Free from addiction, free from violence, free from hopelessness and free from hurt. Through Jay's program, I started to feel good about myself, my fitness, my worth, and I knew that I could work hard for a brand new life. For the first time in a long time, I felt like living again. I began to hold on to the words that Jade had once spoken to me. The pull to your future must be bigger than your pull to your past. Fortunately, I was able to go away for nine months to a program in Esperance where I began my rehabilitation. Rehabilitation helped me cut ties from my past and have the strength to build a new future. I went on to marry, moved into a private rental and I received my children back into my care. I am now doing further study and have my sights set firmly on giving back to the community. I am forever grateful for those who gave me back my life. They have not only changed my destiny but also the destiny of my children. I am no longer passing on brokenness, crime and violence to the next generation, but by the grace of God I am passing on love, wholeness and restoration in the hope for a better tomorrow for them. And now with the strong support of the community, I am grateful for my second chance. My name is Amber. I'm 35. I was first incarcerated in 2000. My life was broken and I often wondered if I could survive another day. As a young girl, I had great dreams of my life, doing well at school and parents who loved me lots. But despite all of this, I was lured into the drug scene at 14 when I began to smoke marijuana. I soon left school at 16 to get a job and move out of home with my boyfriend. This became the beginning of gaining and then losing jobs, trying to go back to school. The lack of routine and motivation caused me much trouble. Marijuana led to ecstasy, ecstasy led to speed. By the time I was 20, I was addicted to heroin. This became my obsession and I would literally do anything to get money for my drugs. It would often cross my mind that I would be lucky to come out of this phase alive. This lifestyle of drugs, crime and violence saw me first arrested in 2000. This became the many revolving doors of corrective services for me. It seemed like prison became my second home. After coming out of prison for the third time, I ended up falling pregnant and had my precious son. I thought this could be a turning point and that the love I had for my son would never be replaced by anything. But sadly, the drug addiction was ruling my life. My son was taken off me when he was very young, and for me, this felt as though my heart was being ripped out. Just when things couldn't get any worse, they did. I was sent to prison for the fourth time in 2011. This was when I came across Jade Lewis's program, Step In. I heard about Jade in 2007 when I read her book, Golden Haze. I was desperate to change my life and felt in my heart that this group would be my key to freedom. As soon as I joined, I began for the first time to feel hopeful. I would listen to the facilitators and really apply myself to their program. 
One of the things we got when we joined this group was a folder of rehabilitation services that Jade was in partnership with and we had the privilege of accessing when we were released. I took their advice and began making steps to go into rehabilitation. It was arranged that I was picked up from the gates of Bandy up in 2012 to begin my rehabilitation. I received access visits back to my son and I've been able to, for the first time, see a light at the end of the tunnel. grateful for my second chance. That's Amber. I get really emotional when I watch those stories because, you know, for a long time I said no to going in there, but at the other side of our obedience is revival. And there's people that need the message. I'm actually going to finish off with a scripture before I ask Pete to come back up here. It's from 1 Peter 2.9. It says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into the light. We have a responsibility to pass this message on to other people. And so um, this morning as we close our head in prayer, I'm just going to hand over to Peter and I hope that from this message you will realise that all of us have it in us and on us to take this message to the world. When we get to the flip side and we stand before our maker, the one thing that will matter is he will ask us, did we do what he asked us to do? We're walking to eternity and we're making eternal footprints in the sand of time and each of us have the privilege to watch God transform lives. Amen. Amen. Amen.